Hi, my name is Camila Marshall. I am a performer. I've performed everywhere, but happily have performed at Musical Theater West in Little Shop of Horrors and Hairspray. Welcome to Celebrate Black Broadway Artist. Every Friday for the month of February, my mother, Stevie Meredith, is going to take you on a 30 minute journey through the history of black musicals and black artists. And tonight in our second week, we're gonna take a look at the white interpretation of the black experience through the lens of some of the older musicals like Showboat and Porgy and Best. And now here's Stevie. Thank you, daughter. That was very nice. And hello to everybody else. I'm so glad to be here celebrating Black History Month with Musical Theater West. We have some great lessons on Black musical theater every Friday night in February. And we invite you to place your comments in the chat, comments, questions. I want to give a shout out right now and a hand clap to all the folks on the Musical West Equity and Inclusion Committee. Everyone has worked really hard on bringing you this amazing offering for Black History Month. The wealth of content that you will find on the MTW website is amazing. The icon of the day has been a great way that I like to start my day. And the Saturday dance classes that highlight some of the talented Black choreographers are unforgettable. And don't forget the Spotify playlist that feeds into everything that we're doing. Of course, I like the Friday night classes. And thank you tonight to Brent Thor and Michael Betts, who are hands down on the controls for the tech tonight, and Paul Garman, who helms the ship at Musical Theater West. Thanks to everybody, and thank you for coming. Last week, we talked about the queen of happiness, Florence Mills. I hope you saw that one, because her name will come up a little later tonight in a different context. Last week, people were texting me that they were going to share the lesson with their middle school students. A couple of people wanted to have blackbird parties like the ones they had for Florence in Europe. One friend's husband was working on a signature cocktail for such an event. Hope I'm invited. Tonight, I'm going to talk about two shows that originated in the 1920s and how the black narrative is shaped when we don't write our own story. Feel free to put questions or comments in the chat. So let's get started. Showboat was written by Jerome Kern and Oscar Hammerstein II and debuted in 1927 and was based on the Edna Ferber book by the same name. I have to be honest, I've seen Showboat at least two times, maybe three. And when I went to refresh my memory, I discovered I didn't know a thing about the plot line. I knew songs from the show, but I had blocked the entire story out. I went to Warren Hoffman's book, The Great White Way, Race and Broadway Musical, which is a great resource book, by the way. According to Hoffman, we have two options for how we can look at Showboat. Option one as a theatrical classic that revolutionized the form, structure, and content of the American musical. Hammerstein's libretto charted new territory by addressing the serious themes of alcoholism, miscegenation, race relations, and spousal abandonment. Kern's music was character specific, and many of his songs, Can't Help Loving That Man, Old Man River, and Bill, became American standards and Broadway classics. One could even say that Showboat helped advance race relations by featuring a racially integrated cast to dramatize concern over the difficult plight of African-Americans in the country. Showboat raised the bar for what the musical could be and what stories could be told. Showboat would forever change the face of musical theater. Hold that thought because we still have option two. Option two, Showboat is a racist musical that demeans African-Americans. Whether forced to work on the levee or in the Showboat's kitchen, the black characters, most notably Joe and Queenie, are given the most subservient jobs and show no character development over the course of three hours. Forced to speak in dialect of childish pidgin English, 
They are poorly integrated into the plot and instead are merely background servants who help the white characters achieve all they can. So that's it. Two ways to look at Showboat. And since its inception, theater go goers have battled about which view reigns supreme. In the spirit of fairness, let's look at both views. Showboat did change the art form. And yes, the black characters are stereotypes. My selections, uh, my selection of this show was really illuminating to me. And I sort of figured out why I blocked it out. There was a lot going on. So let's talk about the black characters, Joe, Queenie, Julie. Kern wrote the role of Joe for Paul Robeson. However, Jules Bledsoe was the first to play the role. Joe's song, Old Man River, had become a standard. Jules had a fair career, but it was the Paul Robeson rendition that reigned supreme. Queenie was played by Tess Gardella, an Italian-American actress. When I first read this, I thought I had misinformation, but I didn't. Tess was not a black woman. She was also known as Aunt Jemima, and she was the only one of the original cast to appear in blackface. Now, if you notice her headshot, can we do her headshot again? Um, she actually, you know, signed it, Tess Gardella, and then she put in quote in the parentheses, Aunt Jemima. And that was when she was doing Ziegfeld Showboat. Okay, Aunt Jemima, that's Tess. Um, I'm just gonna leave that there and invite your comments. Lastly, the role of the mulatto Julie was played by Caucasian actress, Helen Morgan. Queenie, Joe, and Julie represent a defined set of black caricatures that have been established by white writers. It was probably Julie's story that caused me to block out most of the plot. Remember, Julie and Steve are married. Julie's a mulatto, Steve's white. At some point, a fellow reveals that Julie is a mulatto and the interracial marriage is illegal in Mississippi. So Steve cuts Julie's hand and sucks her blood. When the sheriff shows up to arrest them, Steve tells that he also has black blood in him. The cast of the showboat backs them up and they don't get arrested, but they have to leave the boat because now that they are black, they can't perform for the white audience. Mm, Steve's uh, thing about, you know, cutting her hand, sucking the blood sort of made me uh, think back to the one drop rule. Like if you have one drop of black blood in you, then you're considered black. I mean, that's kind of not the way they meant it. Like you can't just whatever. Okay. But that was Steve and Julie's plight. Later in the show, when Julie's working at a cabaret and Magnolia comes in, she overhears Magnolia say she can't get a job because the cabaret's full. And so Julie then gives up her job at the cabaret so Magnolia can have a job. Again, sacrificing for the white character. Okay, so the discussion of Showboat could go on and on for hours. And I need to get to Courtney and Bess, but I do want to shed a bit of light on the opening number. Cotton Blossom, the song that sets the stage for what we are about to see. I have mostly heard the lyric as colored folks work on the Mississippi, colored folks work while the white folks play. But in 1927, the opening lyric of Jerome Kern's song, the words colored folks were actually in words. Yeah. In words work on the Mississippi. In words work while the white folks play. Okay, let's picture it. The curtain opens and the first thing the all white audience hears is in words work on the Mississippi. In later productions, in the 1936 film version, it was changed to darkies. Darkies work on the Mississippi. And in the 1946 revival, it became colored folks work. 
in the film till the cloud till the clouds roll by it was here we all work that's the uh version that the temptations used on their album when melvin sang old man river here we all work on the mississippi here we all work while the rich folks play and finally by 1966 revival nobody worked because the black chorus had been eliminated from the opening number. Questions, comments? Let's get moving, talk about Porgy and Bess. Written by George Gershwin with a libretto by DuBose Haywood and adapted from Haywood's novel, Porgy. It is the story of Porgy a disabled man living on Catfish Row in Charleston, South, Car South Carolina, and his attempts to rescue Bess from Crown, her violent lover and sport in life, her drug dealer. Opening on Broadway at the Alvin Theater on December 10th, 1935, Porgy ran for 124 performances and a running time of four hours. Todd Duncan starred as Porgy, and the 20-year-old Annie Brown was Bess. The role of sport in life was played by John W. Bubbles. I did find a fun fact when I read down the cast list. John Rosamond Johnson played the role of Frazier, a Black lawyer. John was also the composer of Lift Every Voice and Sing, otherwise known as the uh, Black National Anthem. No matter how much we like the music, those questions about genre, about representation, about appropriation have followed Porgy through more than eight decades of convoluted, sometimes troubling history, and they remain today. Most urgently is Porgy is a sensitive portrayal of the lives and struggles of a segregated African-American community in South Carolina. Maya Angelou, who was a young dancer, performed in a touring production in 1955, later praised it as great art, a human truth. Or does it perpetuate degrading stereotypes about black people told in Wentz inducting dialect? Harry Belafonte turned down an offer to star in the film version because he found it racially demeaning. The fact that the most performed opera about the Afri African-American experience is the work of an all-white team has not been lost on Black composers who struggled to get their music heard. Porgy and Bess was riddled with racial stereotypes. African-Americans live in poverty. They take drugs. They solve all their problems with their fists. The fact that the show has little more than suffering says to me that the show was written for a white audience to view the suffering of the black race and feel better about themselves when they leave the theater. Gershwin discussed aspects critics later decried as stereotypes, writing that because Porgy and Bess deals with Negro life in America, brings to the operatic form elements that have never before appeared in opera and I have adapted my method to utilize the drama, the superstition, the religious fervor, and dancing and irrepressible high spirits of the race. So it seems he felt like he was um, helping the race out a little bit. But how, Hall Johnson, a Black composer and arranger and choir director whose musical Run Little Chillin' had been a success on Broadway in 1933, Howe wrote that Gershwin was as free to write about Negroes in his own way as any other composer to write about anything else. In a 1936 essay in Opportunity. But he added that the resulting work was not a Negro opera by Gershwin, but Gershwin's idea of what a Negro opera should be. Decades later, reviewing the film, James Baldwin echoed that, that critique, writing that 
while he liked Porgy and Bess, it remained a white man's vision of Negro life. There has been much discussion about the music of George Gershwin. In the summer of 1934, Gershwin worked on the opera in Charleston, South Carolina. He drew inspiration from the James Island community, which he felt preserved some of the original African musical traditions. The music itself draws on his New York jazz roots, but also draws on the Southern Black traditions. Gershwin modeled the pieces after each type of folk song that he knew about. Jubilees, blues, praying songs, street cries, work songs, and spirituals are blended with traditional arias. Remember last week I said, we go back to Florence and pick up a little tidbit? Well, sometime in 1925, William Grant Steele asked Florence Mills whether if he wrote some music for her, she would sing it in a concert. She agreed, and so did her manager, Lou Leslie. So it happened that Still wrote Levy Land, consisting of four songs with orchestral accompaniment. The audience at the Aeolian Hall included the likes of Arturo Toscanini, James Weldon Johnson, Carl Van Vechten, and George Gershwin. The last piece, The Backslider, moderately slow with expression, is probably the most dramatic of the four. A tale of religion lost through jazz. It might well have raised a few eyeballs amongst the staid audience of serious musicians and classical fans. It's not hard to imagine that it might have stimulated some ideas in George Gershwin's mind for his future Porgy and Bess, as it could well serve as an anthem for Bess. Um, I, I went to find this piece of music, Levy Land, was kind of hard to find. Um, but when I was doing the show about Florence Mills um, for Jonelle Allen, I went in search of the backslider. Um, I ended up at um, the Kennedy, uh, not the Kennedy Center, Lincoln Center Library. And uh, that's where I found the actual music, which... You know, you had to put the white gloves on to turn the pages, but it was really quite interesting and did have uh, similarity, similarities to Porgy and Bess. Devone Times, a bass baritone who starred recently in The Black Clown, a new musical adaptation of Langston Hughes's searching 1931 poem exploring race and representation said in an interview that it made him uneasy that the only black opera in the canon and still one of the main opportunities for many black singers requires them to don costumes of rags and embody flat stereotypes. Just as we have moved from aggression to microaggression, from analog to digital, and from low fidelity to high definition, he said in an interview, so too must we move from broad brush strokes and put a finer point on the pen that delineates the black experience. So tell me how you feel about these two musicals, Showboat and Porgy and Bess. How do we feel about the way that people outside our culture tell our stories? I'm gonna ask Michael to jump in and let's have a little bit of a conversation because he did say that Corgi, I mean, Showboat was one of his favorite musicals. He's oh, seen and I'm as, red, I'm as red as my shirt, Stevie Meredith. Oh, uh, no, no. I no. love, I, I have to put this up first, though, because you need to read this comment from Leilani. Leilani says, I mean, the first 10 minutes we've learned Showboat opened with the N-word and an Italian-American in blackface who was known as Aunt Jemima played Queenie. Stevie is giving a masterclass straight, no chaser. Wow. Thank you, Leilani. Um, I, you know, it's that kind of thing. 
Okay, so I said to Michael a little earlier, I think what happens to people is that they dive in, they love the music of a show without a whole lot of thought as to what the story is. And as a storyteller, as a writer, I'm always annoyed that we don't pay it, that we don't wrap up loose ends or tell what happened to so-and-so after they had a big number and then they just disappeared. I like for the story, it's musical theater, which means there should be the story, the music, the dancing. So I like it all to reflect something. I don't, I don't like it just to be like, oh, but we love the music, let's do it. So tell me the story about you and your mom going to see it. Oh, oh, Showboat. We've actually never seen Showboat. We've seen Porgy and Bess oh, okay. together, which we'll talk about. Okay, so tell me why you like Showboat and you followed showboat. it in there. Well, and, and I was trying to think about, well, I told Stevie a couple of weeks ago that when I was auditing colleges, the sh the How Prince Showboat tour was out. And so literally every city that I was auditing, auditing colleges in, I would go see Showboat. And I think part of me loved it for the spectacle and the sound and the songs, as you know, because that Jerome Kern is my mom's favorite composer. And so that was always in our house. Um, but in thinking about it while you were talking, I think I've sort of, from my place of white privilege, I think I've always sort of viewed the African-American cast as the Greek chorus of the show, especially how Prince pushed that Joe kept coming on to do reprises of Old Man River. They seemed like the only sane ones, at least in that product, in the newest production, because all of this crazy stuff is happening to the white people, and and the the black cast is sort of the constant, much like Old Man River himself. They're just they have a consistency that the white people don't have in the show. Okay, good. My, my um, somebody asked me yesterday, did I think, didn't I think that there was, you know, a lot more diversity and um, in theater? And I said, I wasn't sure because sometimes I feel like the black people are props in the telling of somebody else's story. Mm -hmm. And immediately I thought of uh, Big River, Roger Miller's musical. And, you know, you can't tell Huckleberry Finn's story without having Jim. Jim doesn't have a story. <laughs> we just need him to tell Huckleberry, we just need him to write on that raft. And then, um, you know, the only other Black people in the show are enslaved people. And, you know, you have the songs, the women sing great songs. It's great music. I love, it's the, the music of Americana. It's great music. But when you look at the, what there is to do for the black people, there's no telling of their stories. There's only the telling of Huck and Tom and everybody else got a little piece of the story and Jim, we don't even know where he's going. I mean, I'm assuming he's on his way to freedom, but it's that that kind of makes me feel like we're props telling somebody else's story. So it's not a show about diversity, showing, you know, drawn out lives of people. What let's hear about this this person over here. What are they going through? What's that person's story? We never really hear that. We only hear um how about the white characters and, and then the black characters facilitate their story. There was a question, uh, another uh, comment up from Lonnie's hot tonight. Absolutely brilliant things in the chat. So y'all, I'm gonna put them up right now. Um, we, okay. I put earlier, Stevie, this is what you're commenting on. Leilani said, I have always had a love hate relationship with Showboat and as I'm older now, I know why. Yeah, then, it's kind of, I, I blocked it all out. She puts she this says, too. Of course, if you look at Showboat from a history of musical theater standpoint, then you can somewhat appreciate the new storytelling that is not focused on showgirls and follies. Thus, my love-hate relationship. 
Yeah, that, Leilani, that's exactly what I was talking about. I mean, I think, especially with these two musicals in particular, there is a love-hate relationship because, I mean, I even had that with Corey and Betts. I mean, I, I know that, sh that show better than I know Showboat, but I'm, girl, just what you're saying, I get it. I love you, Corey. I love you. Best you is my woman now. I don't know how I feel about all of that. I think, Stevie, that Warren Hoffman says it really early in his book. And I fall in love with this this book, Great White Way, that Stevie first mentioned in a Culture Equity and Inclusion Committee meeting for Musical Theater West. And I've fallen in love with it because it's just, it's so crazy eye-opening. He, he basically says the white audience thinks the, the white story and what's on stage is universal for everybody. And that's why in my place and with my race, I didn't see that. Sure. The in Showboat is two dimensional and the black cat and Corgi is all in rags. You just sit back and think, oh, this is great storytelling. When it, <laughs> it's not, it's not at all. Even well, with audio performing it. You guys are pretty vocal in this chat. I'm loving Leilani. She just she apologized. I put up earlier. She said, "Sorry, musical theater is my jam." Don't apologize. Not never. No. Please. We love we love the comments and the the discussion. Um, I think one of the ways that we can ferret out where this discussion of inclusiveness and equity is coming in theater is to have the discussion, mm -hmm. so that we can hopefully then distill all the information and come to a conclusion. So well, and, Megan Ryan Crockett says hi. Hi, Megan. And here's something that we all have to celebrate because I'm thrilled. I don't know if you are, Stevie. Um, Brandy's Cinderella is finally on Disney+. Plus. Um, tonight actually is the night that Musical Theater West would have opened its production of Cinderella. Wow. Where we were talking about diversity in the cast and all of that. But that, that shows us so how far we've we've come and how far we have yet to go because it's not normalized still. But right. Brandy being Cinderella gave a whole different generation and a whole different race a chance to go, I can be a princess too. Absolutely. And that's, that's heaven and she was heaven. And it's not lost on me that the icon of the day today was Brandy. <laughs> so there you have it. Um, Judy Matson says, I think that one of my favorite songs in all musical theater is, Judy says, Old Man River, which is how I would say it, but it's actually Old Man River, O-L apostrophe. Um, so yeah, that's that's what I was talking about earlier, is that we, we fall in love with the songs separately mm -hmm. from the story. But then when we see the story, I mean, I've I guess I felt some kind of way about the curtain and opening and everybody singing here we all work. Cause the truth was everybody wasn't working in that scene. So um, I hope you guys had fun tonight. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Paul Garman's got a thing. Yeah. Says, what would be some good examples of musicals that tell the black experience the be in the best possible light? One of my favorite examples of that, and Musical Theater West has actually produced it, is Hairspray. Um, because the Black characters have stories of their own, um, separate from the white. You know, you hear the white stories and you, you hear the Black people's stories. And at some point, um, they come together. Um, it's, you know, important to know that the Black people can only dance on Negro Day and how they feel about that. So we're, it's not just what happens, it's how they feel about what happens. So I think Hairspray is, is a great one. Okay, kids, it looks like we are almost out of time. Michael, why don't you give the pitch for all we're doing? Memphis, oh. Paul says, what about Memphis? Memphis. Yeah, Memphis is one too. Memphis is a good one too. So uh, Mo Motown? Motown, yes or no? Um, it's good. It's, I mean, it's good. We have to. They don't really have stories. They're just singing the songs. They don't have a lot of and, stories. And it's 
And Barry Gordy has highly fictionalized his story. <laughs> highly fictionalized. But there's, you know, there's a lot that we can do. And I understand that a lot of theater lovers love the old uh, shows. And so um, we still do them. But I just think we need to be thoughtful about it. I, I'm not ad advocating that they be erased. But I think a lot of them belong in the history book. So they can be taught, but not done. Michael, tell them about what we're doing. Oh, oh Leilani, why? This is one of my favorite, like, I would love to go in depth with and hear Stevie talk about this. Lena Horn. Yeah. Everybody says and we don't even have time to talk about Lena Horn and Showboat. We need a part two. Well, there's only four Fridays in February, and I booked up. I have my program planned, but you and I can talk later. Oh, I want to be in on that call. And Stevie, we need to have you back past this month. There need to be more of these. I don't know about you all at home. I enjoy my Friday nights thoroughly now. We have two more. Join us next week. Uh, we're going to talk about the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Yes, Stevie, is that correct? Yeah. I think one of them's the nineties too. So okay. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're definitely just, talking about, oh, we're moving forward. We're talking about the best Dolly. Sorry, Carol Channing. I loved her, but we're talking about the best of Dolly. We're and, doing Dolly, uh, tap dance kid. We're doing Motown's guys and dolls. We're doing your arms too short to box with God and the wigs. Mm -hmm. Next week's going to be fun. So excited. Tomorrow morning or tomorrow, almost afternoon, tomorrow at noon, we have a tap class with Brandon Burks. Many of you saw him in La Mirada's production of Singing in the Rain. He was Cosmo Brown. He's given a tap class uh, celebrating the work of Savion Glover. We can't wait to have him tomorrow at noon. Sign up for that. Please don't forget, uh, you can donate. The donate uh, link is in the chat tonight. All of the donations go directly to our teaching artists like Stevie and like our dance teachers on Saturdays. So please support them, come to our classes. As Stevie mentioned, go to musical.org forward slash celebrate. Uh, I will put that in the chat as well. Uh, and, and you can see everything else we're doing uh, this month. Uh, icon of the day, every day, there's a different uh, black Broadway artists that we're celebrating. Um, so Stevie, words of wisdom, what are you gonna send us out with tonight? I just think we need to be thoughtful. It, it, only, it only takes a moment to think about what the message is we're trying to leave an audience with. And it, there definitely should be a message, but we have to be thoughtful about what that is. I had to laugh because you said it only takes a moment and we're doing Dolly next I week. I know, I know, it's in my head. I've been listening to it. <laughs> So that's the perfect, if you have not heard the Pearl Bailey cast recording of Hello Dolly, what are you waiting for? Get off this call, get off this uh, this broadcast. When we end it, go to Spotify, go to iTunes, go to, uh, go to Amazon Music, listen to that cast recording, listen to The Wiz, listen to the Motown Guys and Dolls. Uh, it's all there for the for the researching and it is brilliant. And we will see you next week. Yay, thank you so much, Stevie. Thank you, bye guys, see you next week.